the flickering light of Asia or the Assyrian nation and church. Agha Petros with his punitive expedition returned to Ermia. No heartier welcome could have been given to any returning conqueror. The character of this demonstration, however, revealed, at least to the Muslim onlookers, something deeper than a mere emotional manifestation of joy. It was mingled with praises and hallelujahs, similar to those which were born centuries before by the triumphs of David over the enemies of Israel. For during those days of anxious waiting, these Assyrians had daily congregated again for prayers and supplications for deliverance from the wrath of their unprovoked enemies. Therefore, as they welcomed with great rejoicing their returning heroes, they landed with greater shouts the power of their fathers and the name of their Redeemer Christ. The Assyrian general had been informed of the presence of the Azerbaijan troops in Salamas and Khoi, but he felt that he was needed where the greatest danger lay and a possible appearance of the Turks in the south. On the other hand, he felt very certain that the Assyrian force stationed in Salamis would be able to cope with any situation that might arise there. The crushing defeat of Simku had staggered the designing Muslims of Salamis. The Assyrians decided not to take any more chances with a deceitful people. David Effendi, the brother of the laminated patriarch, who was the commanding general of the Assyrian troops in Salamis, served the inhabitants of Delaman the capital of the district, with an ultimatum to surrender all their arms, the piles of guns and ammunition. Taken from the Muslims revealed the extent of their secret preparations for a murderous uprising against the Christians. With the surrender of arms by the Muslims, the city itself fell into the hands of the Assyrians. This disarming of the civil population, however, did not dishearten to a very large extent. The officers of the Azerbaijan troops the latter were informed by Tabriz authorities of the approach of strong Turkish forces from the direction of Ashnuk, immediately west and southwest of Ermia, and also of a large force of Tabriz and Khoi volunteers, who had already arrived at the scene of the impending battles. Azerbaijan troops planned to attack from two directions. One of their forces advanced on the state road running between a long chain of hills on the one side and the lake of Ermia on the other while their larger army came from the direction of Khoi. The latter opened the hostilities by firing on an Assyrian picket stationed some distance from Salamas, and on the caravan road that connected Delaman with Khoi. The Assyrian picket withdrew as instructed in order to draw the vastly superior numbers of the enemy close to their prepared position. It was taken for granted that the enemy, as usual, would move slowly and cautiously. This was decidedly to the liking of the Assyrian general, who had planned to attack the approaching forces one at a time. Thus, the Tabriz army was met at Tassai, some 30 miles from Salamas. It was crushed beyond the possibility of rallying again. It suffered staggering losses. The fleeing soldiers of the crown prince, together with the bloodthirsty fanatical volunteers of Islam, took to the hills, dropping like leaves in their flight, being pursued by the heathen they had despised so bitterly included the rich spoils of the small arms and ammunition. The Assyrians captured also a field cannon, which they later used to great advantage. In the meanwhile, the stronger army of Khoi had come within the striking distance of the Assyrians, and advance guard of the latter deserted their position as to be observed by the enemy. Unaware of the star that had befallen its left wing, the army of Tabriz attacked with a defeating shout. It was a tactical call upon the name of Ali, their prophet. But Ali, like the prophets of Baal, must have fallen leap. He failed to respond to their call. Perhaps alluring sights under the shade trees of a camel rat eyes were too interesting for him to be disturbed by the urgent call of his followers, or perhaps when he had decreed holy wars against the heathen. He had never dreamed of a pageantry of the machine guns with which his holy warriors would be welcomed. However, the governor general's army of Khoi was literally cut up and almost annihilated. The dead and the wounded were counted by the thousands. Perhaps more than two or possibly 300 men escaped to hide in the hills, awaiting the fall of darkness in order to make their way back to their homes. But the most amazing aspect of the battle was that the Assyrian casualties did not exceed more than 10 men in dead and wounded. It was not possible that the Almighty had thundered with his righteous wrath against the successors of the old Canaanites. The situation here presented a different outlook from that in Europe. 
God must have looked upon the scene of these battles from a different angle. This was not a war for conquest. There was no imperial ambition here. Commerce and Mammon had not called these armies into the field of battle. No geographical boundaries were involved, and no claims of violated rights were made a pretense for the shedding of human blood. This was a campaign of murder by the adherents of Muhammad, a satanic determination on the part of the Muslims to wipe off the name of the followers of Christ from the face of these already benighted regions. Can we not then believe that the God of Joshua in these later days thundered against an army of personified demons? The armies of Tabriz were defeated and crushed, and the hope of the governor general of Azerbaijan centered now in the possibilities of the Turkish forces from the west.